Hey everyone, God bless you and thanks a lot for tuning in. My reflection today I've been entitling Worthless Prayer. Worthless Prayer. As sad as those two words are in their being joined together. Worthless Prayer happens to be a fundamental theme in the hymnody of Great Lent for Orthodox Christians. It comes up over and over again in the Vespers and the Orthro services during the week, especially on Mondays. It also comes up of many places in the Great Canon of St. Andrew, which we chant in the first week of Lent, and then again in the fifth week of Lent. And then it's found in its most poignant expression in all of the Holy Scriptures, in the first chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah, and we Orthodox Christians read the prophecy of Isaiah throughout Lent. In the sixth hour, it's appointed to be read. In fact, the most powerful teaching about worthless prayer comes in the very first chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah, which is read in Pure Week. Some parish churches, of course, don't have the sixth hour service. Sometimes we priests take the reading from the sixth hour and append it to the Orthros service in the morning if we're doing Lenten Orthros. But this text from Isaiah chapter 1 is devastating, absolutely devastating and instructive in the most profound ways. The context uh, is Isaiah's ministry. It's the 8th century. Uh, it's been a period just before Isaiah's ministry began, a period of uh, peace in the north and the south of Israel. But that peace is soon to be shattered by an ascendant and aggressive Assyrian kingdom that wanted empire and uh, rule uh, over the earth. The people are praying to God, but God is not listening. Their prayers have become a stench to him. He does not pay any attention. Their prayer is worthless, hence the title of our reflection today, Worthless Prayer. Listen to these beautiful words uh, of Isaiah, as painful as they are. I say they're beautiful because truth, even when it hurts, is beautiful and it leads to the potential for salvation. Isaiah 1, verse 2, Sons I have reared and brought up have revolted against me. This is how the prophecy begins. God speaking through his prophet, and God says, My sons that I have carefully nourished as their father have revolted against me. Oh, familial rebellion. They're not interested in knowing God. And then he continues to describe how the Lord's people are in their great sin. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. They have abandoned the Lord. They despise the Holy One of Israel and turned away from him. Oh, what a charge. What a prophetic injunction. What is the Lord so upset about? Well, he's mostly upset about the fact that his people don't care to know him. Think about that. They don't want to know God. God knows them, but they aren't interested in the returning the favor. How could it be, we who, who know that this resonates sometimes with us, how could we be so deaf to beauty and truth, so blind, that we won't want to know the living God, which is eternal life itself, Jesus says. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This is the Lord's injunction, his challenge to them, his charge. They've abandoned him, despised him, turned away from him because they're not interested in knowing him. This is, of course, a violation of the first and great commandment, Jesus teaches us, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Nothing, we should be interested in nothing, in knowing nothing more than knowing God. And then in that knowledge, know the rest of the world. 
He continues, as though their violation of the first great commandment wasn't enough. They also are violating the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. He continues, your hands are full of blood. They were engaged in violence. And if they were engaged in violence, just think of us today. So much violence. So this is the condition of the people. It's so bad, Isaiah says in verse 9, they have become so bad that they are like Sodom and Gomorrah. Saying that, there, there's nothing worse than that Isaiah could have said. To take up the remembrance of Sodom and Gomorrah, this is you know, 1,200 years. This is from the time of the patriarch Abraham, 2000 BC. This is the 8th century. This is 1,200 years before this, 1,300 years before this. And yet the image of Sodom and Gomorrah remains, you know, stuck. This is what a people who have abandoned God and have given themselves to every perversion, this is what happens to a people. The plains of Gomorrah were referred to uh, even by the church fathers. They, they had a visual re remembrance of how horrible uh, the life of godlessness is. He's saying that Israel, God's people, not Sodom and Gomorrah now, he's taking, he's taking that description of those uh, wretches and he's applying it to God's own people, the covenant people, to Israel herself. They deserve to be completely and totally decimated. This is what God is saying through his prophet. Of course, our Lord Jesus Christ picks up the same prophetic trope and he uses it in his own teaching to issue woes against the cities where he had performed many miracles, but they didn't repent. <laughs> they weren't interested in knowing him, just like Israel in the 8th century wasn't. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, Capernaum. If the miracles had occurred in Sodom and Gomorrah that incurred in, in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes, Jesus said. This is just where we were this last Sunday, right? If you are an Orthodox Christian and you were worshiping in church, you would have heard the story of Jesus' miracle, healing the paralyzed man who was brought to him in Capernaum by his friends, four friends carrying him on a pallet. They lowered him through the roof and Jesus performed this great miracle, using it as an occasion to reveal himself as the forgiver of sins, as the divine son of God who's capable and willing to forgive men's sins, the greatest disease that we have that town did not respond to that miracle well, and Jesus pronounced a woe upon it and said its destiny uh, is worse than the destiny of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wow. Piety, not rooted in a desire to know God. If we pray, but we're not praying chiefly to know him, to learn to love him, Religion not centered on loving God is foul. Piety that doesn't express itself in loving your neighbor as yourself. If we speak the words of praise to God, but our hands are involved with blood, we're violent, we're participating in evil deeds and working in evil industries that hurt people, our piety is grotesque. This is the message of the prophet. Next, he continues and explains the result. What's the result of God's people living this way? Well, the result, he gives four, four reflections from God's perspective. First, God disdains his people's sacrifices, his, their liturgical services, their work, despises them. Verse 11, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. The offerings are worthless. All that they were doing for God, which he commanded. He's the one who commanded the animal sacrifices. Not because the blood of animals take away sins. The fathers say that God commanded animal sacrifice in the Old Testament as a preventative so that the people wouldn't participate in pagan satanic worship and would be prepared for the coming of the Lamb of God the Lord Christ himself, who would take away the sins of the world by his own sacrifice on the cross. But God disdains even what he commands when it's brought to him with this kind of life, no interest in knowing him and 
no love for other people. That's number one. God disdains his people's sacrifices. He's offended by their incense. Incense is an abomination to me. He commanded the incense. He even gave Moses the recipe of the incense. Incense is to be a beautiful offering to God, and it is when it's combined with a desire to please him, love him, know him, and to serve others. But in this case, not just their sacrifices and liturgical services, the incense itself is a foul stench in God's nose. Third, God cannot endure their keeping of the Sabbath and the holy days, their whole liturgical calendar, which he ordered. The four seasonal fasts, the great feasts, Passover, Pentecost, all of these things, foul to him can't endure them. Quote, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. Those two together. Hear that? Why does he not like their solemn assembly? Because they're living in iniquity. There's no repentance. There's no humility. And they're participating in, in these, these divine services with hearts like that. Says The Lord says, I can't endure it. I hate your festivals and feasts. They are a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Not only are they foul, but God has been worn down <laughs> and as much as God can be worn down. He's worn down. Sinning is bad enough, but going to church with those sins, the joining of the two is just intolerable. And then lastly, God rejects their worthless prayer. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Oof, Lord have mercy. Just saying these things from the prophet Isaiah just leaves me breathless. God forbid that we live like this. God forbid that our sacrifices, our liturgy, our incense, our keeping of the holy days, our prayer becomes worthless and a foul stench to God. St. John Chrysostom writes in his commentary on Isaiah 1, there is no benefit in prayers if one if the one praying stays in his sins. And Isaiah, as the evangelical prophet that he is, ends with a call to repentance and a great offer of salvation. The Lord speaks this truth in love. He says these extremely hard words to his people through his prophet Isaiah so that they will awaken to the danger of their own situation, that they are in a catastrophically dangerous scenario because of their love affair with sin and their disregard of piety and loving God. And these are his words, wash yourselves, remove the evil of your deeds, cease to do evil, learn to do good. We can cease evil immediately by repentance, and then we put ourselves in a position of discipleship to learn to do the good. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless. Don't shed blood, don't practice violence, don't kill children. Instead, reprove those who do. Defend the orphan, plead for the widow. These are the words of the Lord. Evil and piety cannot coexist. And then he offers them this gracious encouragement. If you do this, if you take my counsel to repent, he says, he gives us a gracious promise. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. If these people repent and choose life, then the Lord will embrace them and grant them incredible things. This is really Isaiah's uh, commentary, inspired by God, of course, uh, on the call of Moses to the people of God just before they entered the promised land. Right. So this is, as I'm saying, about 600 plus years before Isaiah issued this call. Moses did the same thing. Let me read it to you. It's an incredible text. That comes at the end of the Pentateuch. It's the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. And this is how he ends. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, 
I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers. What a beautiful word. Dear ones, let us now, this great land, choose life. Let us humble ourselves and reason with the Lord. Put our heads down and repent of our sins, joining love for God to love for people. This is a piety that will make our prayers authentic and powerful and not worthless. Let us learn to do good, loving mercy. God be with you. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present Enduring Love, Laying Christian Foundations for Marriage. Marriage preparation, together with the sacred institution itself, has fallen on hard times in the post-Christian West. It is more important than ever for couples to saturate their hearts and minds with the glorious vision of holy matrimony presented by the church in holy tradition and lived by countless saints. Here in these pages, couples will find inspired teaching from the Holy Scriptures, the writings of the Holy Fathers, and the service text of the sacrament itself on how to live in a genuinely Christian marriage in which the home becomes a domestic church. Through enduring love, may God inspire the hearts of those preparing to be married and also those already married who would like to deepen their union and render it more pleasing to God. Available now at Amazon and Barnes & Noble.